I wake up every day and I look in the mirror and I see not just this beautiful mug, but I see a reflection of my history, my past, and I also see the country that raised me. It's really quite relative. My experience is not like yours or anyone else's. And, uh, and that's where I'd like this all to begin. I want to tell you a little story about cannabis. And what it looks like is a mirror. When you look in the mirror and you see those fine lines, you see the sunscreen you should have worn in your 20s and a promise to yourself that you're going to wear sunscreen going forward. With cannabis, we have an 80-year history that we haven't been privy to unpack because it's not our own personal story. And I can't imagine that many of you in this audience were around at the beginning of cannabis prohibition. Anybody 100 in here? Let's take a look at this reflection. I'm going to tell you the story of the cannabis history. And I think you're going to see a little bit more openly about the future. Let's get intimate really quickly. Who here uses cannabis? Yeah. OK, but not enough of you. So what I need you to do is close your eyes, cover them if you need to, because I know you're sitting next to your neighbor, and we don't want to tell everybody our secrets. Now, who here uses cannabis? Yeah, that's better. Awesome. Oh, so if this was 1930, every single one of you would have raised your hands. Every single one of you. If your eyes are still closed, keep them closed. If they're not, fine. Let's do a little visualization. Imagine 1930, you're sitting here in this epic theater. You're doing pretty well. We know this because it's recession. And you're sitting in this nice theater. You've got a popcorn in one hand, an RC cola in the other. You ended up here because this morning you picked up a newspaper and you saw All Quiet on the Western Front. Gotta go, feature film, it's gonna be amazing. You're watching this film because you're excited about it and you need something to distract you from the nerves of the recession. The projector starts to roll, the curtains are drawn back to reveal the screen. At this point in the evening, the movie hasn't even started, and every single one of you has used cannabis at least three times. Think about it. The newspaper that you picked up that morning is made of hemp fiber, pulp turned into paper. The cola and the, uh, the popcorn that you're eating, the paper products that are holding them were also made of hemp fiber. The ropes used to draw back the curtains, made of hemp. Three times right there. You might even go home and take a cannabis tincture to soothe the indigestion from that junk food and maybe the nerves of the recession. Incredible. This history is amazing. And here we are, 80 years later, with no perspective on that. So let's do a little dive. I'm going to tell you what marijuana is because you're probably really confused. And I'm going to tell you what cannabis is because, again, you're probably really confused. How does it come together? And what's hemp? So looking here at the slide, you can see that they're depicted a little differently. And it's because cannabis is the same plant, but in two different forms, like many other species we see. It's presented differently by the way we grow it and by the intentions that we have for the plant. Marijuana presents as a little bit bushier, smaller, uh, because we're growing it primarily for THC, which is a compound we'll get into in a second. Hemp is grown to look more like bamboo. It's taller and thinner because we're using it mostly for fiber. It has a higher presentation of CBD, which is cannabidiol. Both THC and CBD are cannabinoids. There are over 150 different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant, probably even more, but we don't know because we can't research it. We can't research it because it's a class one drug. It is federally illegal for us to research this plant. Cannabidiol found in CBD also found, I'm sorry, cannabidiol found in hemp also found in marijuana is in higher presentations of hemp, uh, and it is known for anti-anxiety, anti-inflammation, and a host of other wonderful medical applications. THC, which is predominantly found in the marijuana plant, is tetrahydrocannabinol. And this is the one that's the psychedelic. It's the one that we know as the plant that gets you high, or the cannabinoid that gets you high, not found in hemp. Maybe it makes a little bit more sense now, how we saw hemp used so predominantly in the past, and how we're seeing marijuana used now. Let's talk about the history, like the deep history, the amazing history. 
In the Chinese texts from early as 2600 BC, just think about that number for a second, 2600 BC, we've been using cannabis for over 2,000 years, and our history is only 80 years old. This text was printed on hemp paper, and it talks about marijuana cannabis being used for medicinal purposes. The Egyptian Evers Papyrus, also printed on hemp paper and hemp pulp, talks about hemp as medicine in 70 AD. Roman medical texts outlining the same thing in 70 AD. Different parts of the world. King Henry VIII ordered hemp to be grown by all of the agriculturalists in his community because it was used for the ships every time they went to battle. The word canvas actually even comes from cannabis. Early Americans, in the same way, were ordered by our government to grow hemp. There was a huge campaign called Hemp for Victory. U.S. pharmaceuticals, a whole host of them. Bristol Myers, Eli Lilly, in the 1900s, medical and apothecary shelves were lined with cannabis tinctures. Cannabis indica, they call it, for stomach pain, for head pain, for knee pain, you name it, the list goes on and on and on. So how did we get here? How did we get to this point where all of these beautiful uses are no longer at our fingertips? We've got some, we've got some interesting history <laughs> in our propaganda campaigns, and you can read it all right there. I don't need to tell you what it says. There was a couple, the story goes, a couple of really powerful members of our culture and of their industry, they got together and decided that it wasn't in their best interest to have hemp as an agricultural crop in the United States. So they started a propaganda campaign, hired a couple political officials, put out a movie called Reefer Madness, cult classic, you can watch it online. And uh, conveniently, at the same time, early 1900s, 1910, was the Mexican Revolution, where we saw a lot of Mexican immigration. Mexican immigration in 1910 in the American Southwest. And so what happened was we found our scapegoat, and it is presented in this fashion. Mind you, this is 30 years before our civil rights movement. So the Mexicans became our scapegoat, and we stopped using the term cannabis and started using the term marijuana, which is the Spanish-Latin term for cannabis. We stopped separating the two. Cannabis was no longer hemp and marijuana. It was marijuana, this loco weed. In 1930, Henry Enslinger was elected the federal, to the Federal Bureau of, the, of Narcotics, which didn't exist before. This was a newly appointed position, conveniently. And, uh, and he enacted the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. This tax act taxed all cannabis growers so all hemp growers for industry, for the 25,000 products across the nation, from fabric to newspapers, everyone had to pay excessive taxes. And in addition to that, one of the clauses, super sneaky little clause at the bottom, says that anybody that consumes it is going to be fined and put in jail. So this gentleman, in partnership with a couple others, one, Hearst, you may know, Hearst is the largest printer, the owner of all the publications at the time, the publications that we saw, calling marijuana loco weed. Um, Hearst also owned holdings in cotton and lumber, so maybe in his interest to eliminate hemp production. And then another company called DuPont was also at the same time patenting synthetic fiber production. We were starting to see nylon as a replacement. Uh, we were starting to see modified cottons as a replacement to hemp fibers. So it's said that these three gentlemen were in cahoots. Who's to know? Uh, what we do know is where we are now. 1970, Richard Nixon is elected, and he begins solidifying this criminalization and illegalization of all cannabis. He began the war on drugs and basically created cannabis prohibition. Now that we've unpacked a little bit of this, we have some perspective. And we know what went on before we got to the point where we are now. And I hope that you can take this information with me and turn it into the opportunity to look at a brighter future. I hope that when you look in the cannabis mirror now, 
you can look back at this history and understand where we came from, and not just see the lines as wrinkles, but really as storytelling lines of experience that tell us where we came from, tell us where we're going. Maybe you can see the opportunity of cannabis as the catalyst for unpacking some of these dilemmas that were created by illegalizing it. It's possible that we could research this drug so that we can potentially use it to treat people that are dealing with opioid addiction. It's possible that we might be able to address prison overpopulation by getting some of these people that were criminalized and put in jail for misdemeanor offenses with small amounts of marijuana, get them out of jail so we can employ them and do something else with our prisons. Maybe, maybe we can create a host of medicines that will do a bunch of beautiful things, or we can prevent crop sterilization and soil sterilization from agricultural overproduction. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. I'm sure your imaginations are going wild now. I really hope that now we can see cannabis as the beautiful plant that it is and as an opportunity to potentially look for a brighter and a much greener future.